And a special welcome to one of my favorite men, as in Professor Sir Roy O.J. O.J., what other title should I give you? <laughs> um, it's just absolutely lovely to see you, and congratulations on your highest Jamaican national award. That's coming up in a few weeks. Um, thanks everyone for inviting me to chair this panel and we are in fact beyond Westminster imagining new futures too. Well in terms of imagining futures I am really delighted to be chairing this particular panel where I'm surrounded by two persons I know very very well. Um, I actually was Sunni's tutor a million years ago in Caribbean economic problems. Um, and of course, Trotz and I go way, way back. So that, let me just introduce our two panelists. Suniti Mirage, she, she really is quite a ranking person in terms of persons who were with us on the Mona campus at a particular time. Suniti is the managing director of the Lloyd Best Institute of the West Indies. She is a career journalist of over 35 years experience and has been group executive for content and editorial development at One Caribbean Media, editor-in-chief of the Trinidad Express, head of news at TV6, and editor of the monthly TNT Review magazine. She's a columnist, media consultant, and runs her own media production company. Sunati is a graduate of the Mona campus of the UWI, and I remember well that she um, received, she earned first-class honors in communications and social sciences and was very much part of our posse, so I'm very pleased to be here today. Alicia Trotz is an associate professor of women and gender studies and Caribbean studies at New College University of Toronto. She's also an associate faculty at the Dame Nita Barrow Institute of Gender and Development Studies at the Cave Hill campus of the UWI. Her research interests include the gendered politics of neoliberalism, social reproduction and women's activism, gender colonial coloniality and violence and transnational migration and diaspora. For the past seven years, Alicia has edited a weekly newspaper column in the diaspora in the Starbrook News, a Guyanese independent newspaper, and she is a member of the Red Thread Women's Organization in Guyana. Each of our panelists has 20 minutes, and we hope to have about 15 minutes left for the rest of you. And ladies, you know the rules. Paper will be passing. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to suggest that when we dig and poke and tweak the Westminster system, hoping to somehow reshape and recontour it to yield representation, we're looking in the wrong place. Let's remember when the system was visited upon us. It took almost 100 years after emancipation for the mass of the population through many different uh, moments of history to get to that place where they simply burst the seams of the system that existed and exploded throughout the Caribbean in all the labor riots. And then miracle of miracles in some countries like in Trinidad they threw up representative organizations that went to the polls and in 1950 a labor leader actually got six seats, his party got six seats. Others who got more than one got two and then there were several independents. And what did the governor do? He promptly wrote to London and said why he, what he had to do to stop that and he appointed whoever he, he wanted to appoint in the legislature. And that was the end of, of Butler, Uriah Butler, and his British Empire workers, whatever party. And in very quick order, in, in one term, six years later, a whole generation of leaders considered fit to rule came to office. In Trinidad, that was Eric Williams. That is a class that Lloyd Best refers to as the Afro-Saxon. And they came to office not just with Westminster. They came with an architecture, an institutional architecture that was designed 
for control and containment to start with because the departing British was soon to be departing wanted to ensure that there was going to be a society that would continue along lines that worked for them. And we cannot talk about Westminster alone because uh, the point I'm making is that there is an institutional architecture and that institutional architecture is expressed through the economy, it's expressed through the education system, it's, it's expressed largely through the justice system. And uh, 50 years later, we are coming up against the logical absurdities of something that calls itself democratic because once every five years we vote. But we cannot influence, and the, and the evidence that we cannot influence it is because of how many people differ all the time and it makes no difference. In fact, I want to suggest that the system we have, I call it a host, it's a body. And every time some new element enters that with a prospect of change, it mutates, it latches on to that bacteria of change, and it transforms itself to look like change. And that is how it has kept itself alive. And so we have, and I'm going to, dis dis I'm going to deal with this very quickly, the most recent and very beautiful, really beautiful um, example of this is how in Trinidad a prime minister could change the voting process completely without ever bringing it to the public. Change the way you vote and simply go to parliament and by virtue of being a government and you have a simple majority, it happens. And it's dressed up in all the language of democracy. It actually looks and smells and tastes almost. Well, maybe it doesn't taste, but it looks and smells. So much so that people all the way from Jamaica I heard um, Trevor Monroe yesterday is talking about this experiment that's going to be so interesting. Where is consultation in that process? And this is where I want to take us very quickly to beyond. Because our predicament today, and um, Bruce Golden talked about it, it happened, he talked about the levels of alienation, and I can tell you in Trinidad it's the same thing, that the segment of the population that is growing is what I will call the center. The parties that are anchored in the political process, the, the, the parts of the electorate that support one or the other, that's the shrinking part. What is growing is that large middle ground of people who do not feel committed to one or the other, but they simply don't know what to do with that. And in Trinidad, what they've been doing, and you haven't been doing it here, is that from time to time, they've been able to form themselves and craft uh, vehicles that influence the outcome. So we actually have been changing governments very rapidly since, since Eric Williams. We have high levels of crime. We have, apart from Trinidad, a um, great deal of debt. We have all the, all the social problems. We have problems of illiteracy, of high levels of graduates and so on without the capacity to, to, to understand without any understanding of the society to solve its problems and so on. And uh, that uh, dysfunctionality, we are often attributing it to economic conditions. And my argument here is that it is the architecture, the institutional architecture, that has the region locked into an unproductive paradigm that does not make the best use of its capabilities, its resources, its, its people, and it does not, does not yield the conditions that lead people to change. What we have is people who remain outside of the system as they remained 100 years ago. It's mutated, it looks different, but they're still outside of the system. To a great extent, Caribbean society is a maroon society. The, the, the economy is functioning out some, in many cases, the economy that people are involved in uh, is, exists outside of the main economy. Um, justice systems exist outside of the formal system. All of this drugs and laundering and so on that is going on, the reason it goes on is that people are finding creative ways for venture capital. In the same way, two and three hundred years ago, People could just arrive in a place and kill off people and just take the land. What is less just about that 
than what you have today of people trading, getting the venture capital and laundering themselves very much in the same way that our elites have laundered themselves and today have secured their generations in terms of income and so on. So the challenge is, so my point is that tinkering with Westminster is really such a, it's almost an exercise in masturbation. <laughs> it is pretty pointless. What the society has needed right from the beginning as we tackle this um, phase of our history when we can claim to be in charge is how do we design a new architecture that will yield the viability for the potential of all of us to be realized, for us to be to have a society of justice, for us to have money in our pockets, for us to educate ourselves meaningfully, for it not to be wasted. What kind of, how do we engage that process? And I see no other way than the way that most politicians find to be useless because it doesn't, it may, may not happen in time for the next election. I also don't feel that the, the answer that was, um, provided by, by Prime Minister Gonzales, that, that that is a viable answer. I don't think that, that reform, and he talked largely about constitution reform, but I think his idea of constitution reform is, he hopes it will yield some kind of social transformation as well. It cannot be paternalistic. You cannot have that kind of reform and transformation that we need handed down from above. The consultation Yes, it was wide. Yes, it was all these things. But I think if you're on the side of change, you have to spend and invest the time, first of all, to the extent you have any skill to help people to articulate interest. It is simply incredible how individuals cannot articulate their interest in this society. And it is because of the, deg the psychological degradation, we often confuse our own int other people's interests with our own. So we are propping up other people's interests and don't see where in it that we're actually going to be the one that's going to be suckered into it. We think we champion and be running it, like the queen, for example. And um, so the time has to be invested in so far as we have any capability in that process of where there are issues of putting our energy on the side of those people who, are, who need the support to carry their issues forward. All over the society, there are large numbers of groups of people who deserve justice, who need to have their position heard, who need to have themselves explained and that is what the education in the society ought to be about. The educated elites have to make a decision of what side of history you're on. Are you on the side of propping up that old order? Are you becoming a Mandarin or a Sherpa to the, an old order that uses young energy for its old dying self? Or are you going to put your energy on the side that needs energy and needs support and needs the, needs the help to become articulate about itself and its interests at the point where it no longer will need that and it can speak to power clearly and with confidence. And that's, that's where I fall on the line or on the side of people who are who talk about civil society. I'm afraid of civil societies that, uh, that defines itself as, you know, existing for funding grants and all those kinds of things, but they are very, very real issues. And I think that it is a support of people where they are living and in matters that affect them, putting your energies there. And if you have an empowered society, it doesn't matter if the system is Westminster, they will be in charge of it and they will hold it to account and it will have to reshape itself in terms of their needs. So I will draw my line there. I should say one word about revolution because that was a topic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the obvious point there is that given the growing alienation, given the growing um, power bases outside the formal system, it is inevitable 
from time to time, we live in a revolutionary part of the world. It's always amazing. People talk about the stable carbon and so on. And any Monday morning, you can wake up and hear there's a coup. But not only that, the form of expression is so largely protest. People who they have no avenues, and so they are protesting. It's, there's a, there's, this is a place of permanent subversion. And they use everything. Mr. Wood is wrong when he said that the, the, the Africans had nothing. They were left with only what the British gave them, that they, they owned it. Actually, if, the, if scholars take the time, they will discover how much, how many systems exist in every single culture outside the system, in formal savings, in formal medicine, in formal justice. There's a whole plethora of systems that are subverting the formal system every single day and keeping us in a zero-sum position, which is why the formal one has, has the levers of power but not power. And the other one has power and no levers of power. All of five minutes. Okay. And so those, that condition of that is, a, that is a conflict. There is an inherent and built-in conflict in the society that if we do not find the avenues for channeling power articulately and meaningfully with, with real representation, it, is, it inevitably will come into collision. And it has come into collision very many times in the past. I do not think that... Um, I, I think I want to say a word too here about the, some of the issues of corruption because that, took, that, that seemed to play a lot yesterday in that everybody's treating corruption as though it's the source of the problem. Corruption is simply the symptom of the problem in that when you get to office and you do not have, you really represent, you don't represent people. What you have to do is buy people. You survive by buying people. You have to take the money to win because you do not really represent these people who are going to vote for you. You don't know what they think. You don't know what their interests are. How are you going to represent them? All you have been able to do is get the vote from them. And so you have to, and the easiest and fastest way is to give money. And to give money, you have to get money. And when you get money from somebody else, you have to give back the contract. So there is a built-in impulse towards corruption that is part of a system that is rotten and dysfunctional. And that is part of the, the, leg the Westminster legacy. It is a, a case of central government from above and subversion below. That is the nature of our society. Um, my argument is that Westminster, Westminster is an active impediment to the progress that we seek and that we have to guard in thinking that we may have answers. We have to guard against the paternalistic instinct to dispense reform from above. We have to devote our energies to the bottom. And that is the, the gradual way. We are too, uh, too many people are too anxious for office. It just turns into dust in your hand, as you can see from how the, the many governments that go in there and can do nothing. And if we invest in that way, it is, um, there's the best chance that we may be able to have effective and viable systems that will forestall and, and deny the need to have to revolute. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to thank, let me just see. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, especially um, Kate and Brian and Christine. And technology is a really interesting thing because, you know, it's the first time I'm meeting Kate, even though I had the honor of um, guest editing a special issue of a journal, Macomera, with her. And it's also wonderful to be on a panel with Sunity, um, who I'm meeting for the first time, even though we've met many times over email and most recently, late last year, in a group that was convened on the internet by Norman Gervan on the, um, uh, the Constitutional Tribunal ruling in the Dominican Republic with respect to Haiti. So at last year's inaugural conference, the late Norman Gervan recalled the ambivalence of several of his generation with the adoption of Westminster arrangements for decolonizing countries. Reflecting on the challenges facing the region some 50 years after the first independence pacts, he offered a sobering account of landscapes laid bare by over three decades of neoliberalism, what he referred to as, quote, existential threats to the survival of territories as viable economies, functional polities, cohesive societies, end quote. 
Although he did not refer explicitly to the disaggregated effects of structural violence, activists and researchers have long pointed to the specific ways in which women have borne the burden of crisis, particularly as it has been accompanied by the relentless privatization of social reproduction. One response to this disproportionality of effect is to focus on the relatively low levels of women in politics, with an emphasis on parliamentary representation as a way of making women's voices heard. This raises a number of questions. Should women seek access to traditional political structures? And what are the limits of a singular focus on the formal political sphere? What difference has it made to women's lives and regional fortunes more broadly that we have had four women as heads of government, notoriously in Dominica, Guyana, and currently in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago? To what extent does the tribalization of politics hamper the creation of meaningful autonomous spaces for women parliamentarians? In Guyana, for example, which underwent a constitutional reform process in 1999 to curb the excesses contained in the 1980 constitution was, that was imposed upon the people of Guyana by a fraudulent referendum to end all referenda, we can think about the supposed advantages of having women in senior government positions where right now we have at least four government ministers and where those advantages are obviated by a list system that entrenches party loyalty over accountability to the electorate. While not underestimating the significance of making women more visible in parliamentary politics through quotas or other measures, I think these examples underscore the need to simultaneously attend to class, race, sexuality, ability, and other social relations that render women a complex category to begin with lest we end up privileging a strategy in which a politics of recognition takes precedence over a politics of transformation. Is the struggle one to gain admission to normative decision-making structures or fundamentally to change them? As the late Stuart Hall presciently noted, there are no guarantees, only politics. These are important issues that activists within the region, like the 51% Coalition of Jamaica, are grappling with and can speak to far more eloquently than I. Instead, this afternoon, I want to offer some beginning thoughts from a slightly different vantage point, one that does not privilege parliamentary representation and, in fact, seeks to think about its limits. And my point of departure comes from two questions that were posed by Norman Gervin last year at the conference in London. One, can the national project be rescued? And two, what is the role of regionalism? And this wasn't actually planned, but it turns out, after hearing the last excellent panel in Sinity, that in fact I'm reprising many of the arguments that Percy and Sinity and um, Patsy made. So what I want to do is to reflect briefly on what a feminist perspective might bring to this discussion and to ground this with two recent examples to help flesh out and give some concrete form to my argument. And here I'm also taking my cue conceptually from the recent work of feminist geographers and critical international relations theorists who explore how dominant geopolitical discourses converge to narrow the terrain of debate and practice so that questions of sovereignty and security rely almost exclusively on state-centric approaches, because I think this allows us to think explicitly about the territorializing practices of Westminster. The first example comes from Guyana. Some of you have heard a bit of this before. A country that made international headlines on July 18, 2012, after police fired tear gas, rubber bullets, and live rounds into a large crowd from the bauxite mining town of Linden. The community had mobilized following a budget announcement that electricity subsidies to Lindeners would be phased out later that year, with some commentators estimating this would lead to as much as an 800% increase in rates. Public action was marked by its ability to galvanize a large cross-section of the community and included a completely successful shutdown day, rally, public meetings, and day of protest and prayer. July 18th was intended to be the first of a five-day community strike. In the wake of the shootings, which injured 20 and killed three men, enraged Lindeners closed off all vehicular entry and exit points, widening the ramifications of this protest well beyond the boundaries of a town that remains the only overland conduit between the coast, the hinterland, and Brazil. The tent standoff lasted for close to a month and ended only with the working out of an agreement with the government to appoint a technical team to investigate electricity provision and rates, an economic committee to explore the revitalization of Linden, a regional land selection committee, and the granting of a broadcasting license to the region, which is the only part of the country that has only permitted access to state television. Separate terms of reference were also drawn up for an in official inquiry into the killings that would be headed by Lensley Wolf of Jamaica.
Given the polarization that has, with few interruptions, characterized formal politics in post-independence Guyana, and listening to Selwyn earlier today, it sounded like he was talking about the creeping Guyanization of Trinidadian politics. But it is perhaps not surprising that the current government, which finds itself in the most unusual position of having a minority in the National Assembly, and possibly facing a vote of no confidence in a few months, would accuse the joint opposition of orchestrating the demonstration in a bid to destabilize the country. Editorials in the state-controlled media ominously warned that the protests were a pretext for anti-Indian aggression, even going so far as to selectively remind the public of the 1964 disturbances when Indian Guyanese were violently evicted from Linden. Those critical of state violence accused the government of deliberately attempting to foster racial animosity to woo disaffected voters back into the camp of the ruling party, of penalizing a predominantly African community that has consistently voted for the opposition, and of reducing the substantive issues raised by the electricity rate heights to stereotyped and racist dismissals of African Guyanese as wanting freeness without responsibility. What difference might a feminist curiosity, to use a phrase popularized by political scientist Cynthia Enloe, make to our apprehension of this state of affairs? Three brief points. Firstly, a feminist curiosity leads us to ask, where were the women, given that they comp comprise 51% of the population? It turns out that women were everywhere, involved in public meetings and demonstrations from the start, out on the streets during the month-long standoff, putting their bodies on the line, organizing public kitchens to feed community members and fellow protesters. This centrality is never accidental. It indexes the heightened inequalities and exclusions of neoliberalism and enables us to provide a relational analysis across multiple scales that includes Linden's materialization as and transformation from a bauxite mining town controlled by multinational capital and producing some 90% of the world's calcine bauxite to an industry today run largely by China's Bosai Minerals Group, employing less than 500 persons and with a 70% unemployment rate. Once a destination point for migrants from other parts of the country, contemporary Linden is the gateway to the interior, a 21st century El Dorado, promising everything from access to Brazil, to drugs, to minerals, to lumber, and to ecotourism. It is also the space that people leave, estimated now to be one of the highest net recipients of remittances in Guyana. Women have been key in seeking what economic geographer Beverly Mullings describes as a spatial fix to the crisis of marginalization, stretching the scale and space of everyday existence. As one letter to a newspaper noted, what leads women to protest is what they know from their family lives, that the work of making ends meet is theirs, and that anything that increases that work is something they must rise up against in defense of themselves, their children, their families." End quote. This is not something new, but the dominant narrative of Linden as a bauxite town, which privileges a waged male workforce, has elided the contributions of women to the domestic and informal economies, two sites that have become increasingly significant as the fortunes of the community have shifted over the years. Accounts of Linden's long tradition of autonomous self-organizing have also defined political agency as the exclusive property of men, rendering invisible the fact of women's mobilization under the Burnham dictatorship when they took to the streets in their thousands in the early 1980s at the height of the food rebellions in Guyana. Secondly, accounting for the marked absence of women from these competing zero-sum narratives reveals the extent to which, in fact, those narratives share the same narrowly truncated and deeply gendered conception of the domain of politics, with considerable and devastating implications for questions of accountability and representation. The apparent unintelligibility, the apparent unintelligibility of women's involvement, and a brilliant example of the domesticating complicities of what some have termed governance or technocratic or rights-based feminism, was also on display in the dismissive response by no less an august body than the Women and Gender Equality Commission created under the terms of the reform constitution to a young woman's effort to interrupt the silence on Linden at one of its meetings. The commission solemnly told her that, that Linden was not a woman's issue. Thirdly, not taking these other sites and actors into account might help to explain what has become of the promises to Lindeners. No woman, if we are looking at the politics of nominal representation, sits on any of the three committees, economic, technical, land. In fact, none has even been convened more than two years after the shootings. Nor do the terms of reference suggest that any of the issues that have raised here will be taken on board. We see this sign lining as well in the recommendations of the Commission of Inquiry that was headed by Lensley Wolf, and it was the only commission to actually discharge its responsibilities.
which revealed much about how gendered notions of value tied to the idea of productive laboring bodies underpinned compensation awards that were given to families, the size of which seemed to rest upon the fundamental assumption of the invisible subsidy of caring labor. The fate of the agreement thus lays bare the hollow guarantee offered by Article 13 of the Guyana Reform Constitution that, quote, the principal objective of the political system of the state is to establish an inclusionary democracy by providing increasing opportunities for the participation of citizens and their organizations in the management and decision processes of the state, with particular emphasis on those areas of decision making that directly affect their well-being, end quote. As the Linden protest and the official response of state-mandated violence make clear, no mechanisms exist for the meaningful realization of this provision, the point about practice that Percy was making. Specifically, the inability to make connections between a repertoire of social protests that wears a public face and the deeply gendered and privatized dimensions of everyday life that fall mainly on women reveals itself as a failure of the political imagination to recognize emergent alternatives that challenge unjust social relations and that might move us beyond barren paradigms. The sense of a clear disconnect between the people and the Guyana Parliament where the budget was read and through which Lyndon has learned without co consultation of the increased electricity rates was effectively dramatized in the capital city by the convening of the significantly named People's Parliament, again led mainly by women, which strategically took up 24-hour watch in a park bordering the busy throughway just opposite Parliament. For nearly four unbroken months, they occupied the space, circulating a petition with a list of demands for parliamentarians, gathering 6,000 signatures, displaying posters, engaging passers-by in conversation, recruiting volunteers, and resisting police efforts to dismantle the site. In declaring itself to be in solidarity with Lindner's struggles, the People's Parliament boldly emphasized the importance of an aware, engaged citizenry and underlined the need for a political system genuinely responsive to and that can also learn from the creative responses of communities. Let me turn very quickly to the second example, the October 2013 Caribbean Court of Justice ruling in Shanique Mairi versus the government of Barbados. Most, if not all of you, are already aware of the case that was brought before the court following the humiliating experiences of Jamaican Shanique Mairi who in 2011 was detained at Grantley Adams and ultimately deported from Barbados after a lengthy interrogation that included a cavity search. Although it did not accept her claim that she was discriminated against on the basis of her nationality, Mary was awarded damages. There has been, rightly, celebration of the CCJ's affirmation of the right of Caribbean people to travel throughout the region under the, re the revised Treaty of Chagoramas. At the same time, and as Derek O'Brien pointed out yesterday, this case underscores significant tensions between competing notions of regional and national sovereignty, as well as some specific dimensions of the freedom of movement provisions under the CSME. A few quick comments. Firstly, instead of a focus on territorial borders and a privileging of national sovereignty, feminist geopolitics rescales discussions of security to foreground embodied experiences of mobility. What then becomes visible are extraterritorial survival strategies prompted by localized insecurities, the deep and everyday injuries of neoliberalism. Kinship is the foundation upon which these intra-regional geographies are mapped by women whose travel constitutes a transnational strategy of social reproduction in efforts to insulate households from the vagaries of the domestic economy. These movements, of course, have rich histories, antecedents that long predate the official lip service paid to freedom of movement and that continue to be thwarted by practices of expulsion, as the Mairi case so evidently showed. In other words, if, as anthropologist Michael Rolf Trio notes, we should apprehend the Caribbean, quote, not in terms of movement between roles or types, but in terms of types or roles that include movement, end quote, then our critical lens would be trained instead on the interruption of this flow, the power relations undergirding the notion of state sovereignty, a principle that in its preoccupation with regulating borders and keeping undesirables out highlights the very real difficulties of implementing freedom of movement under CARICOM. It enables us to grapple with the ways in which migrants are constructed as a threat and to explore the unevenness that allows capital to move seamlessly while labor is cordoned off. To consider then are how migratory circuits are variously regulated to respond to the differently gendered needs of global capitalism. The spatial circuits that tend to get emphasized in wider discussions of the global care chain, labor flows from the south to advance industrialized and newly industrializing economies, obscure a long tradition of migrations within the Caribbean from migrant sex workers to women traders. Yet this significance has never really been recognized at the level of policy. For instance, under the CSME, the first categories of workers to be recognized originally excluded domestic and hospitality workers and traders or higglers those who have created a vibrant informal economy 
while crucially forging a vernacular regionalism that crosses linguistic boundaries. The gender and class dimensions of this decision confirm the undervaluing and misrecognition not only of the skill involved, but the centrality of women's work in creating regional economic space. The Myri case highlights the fact that while the CCJ decision has forcefully put on the table the question of member state obligations under the revised Treaty of Chaguramas, and yesterday Derek talked about the significance of Articles 241 and 242, the truth of the matter is that questions of enforceability remain a very real issue, and in fact there have been several anecdotal examples, one from Trinidad and Tobago just last week, of expulsion since the Myri decision has, was rendered. And as Patsy earlier pointed out, and Terry Ann has shown in her work, the heads of government also remains the sole decision-making body within the integration movement. There is no functional institutional mechanism to meaningfully incorporate the input of regional civil society, while the Assembly of Caribbean Community Parliamentarians is restrictive in membership, has only a deliberative function, and has met no more than three or four times in the last 18 years. Moreover, there are real tensions between the regional decisions heads of government may take and the national arena where such directives require domestic legislation or other action before they can be effectively operationalized, but where instead they are likely to fall victim to oppositional parliamentary politics and the expedient and short-term pressures of election cycles. One example is domestic workers who were finally permitted to travel under the freedom of movement provisions about five years ago once they had acquired regionally recognized vocational certification, or these CVQs. Up to a few years ago, Guyana was the first and only country where this was raised in Parliament. I don't know how much has changed since then. It was actually brought before our National Assembly um, by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Carolyn Rodriguez. Statistics have been extremely difficult to come by, but available evidence suggests that most women who migrate for domestic work across the Caribbean overwhelmingly relocate as undocumented workers rather than through work permit or freedom of movement arrangements, suggesting significant bureaucratic and other hurdles to legal travel. And according to the CSME unit in Barbados, CVQs are supposed to be drawn up through national training agencies, but it is not clear how many, if any, countries have provided comprehensive guidelines for these. In a recent study, and I noted that women without papers face sexual harassment and abuse, discrimination from immigration and law enforcement um, officials and possible deportation. They are also exposed to xenophobic prejudice which scapegoats them as putting an unnecessary strain on resources and leaves them vulnerable to further exploitation as a disposable workforce. As Lisa Lowe describes, such targeting exemplifies, quote, a performance of narrow government power in the face of declining state sovereignty, end quote. The fact that there exists no meaningful institutional space to which these women might turn for the collective defense of their rights also, I think, raises very uncomfortable questions for us about how frequently the imaginary of advocacy organizations also operates within the circumscribed terrain of the national, eliding the lived experiences of those who do not occupy the space as citizens. One encouraging sign in this regard has been the establishment of the Caribbean Alliance of Domestic Workers and a conference held in Jamaica in 2011 at which migrant domestic workers was a central issue. The challenge is for this network and others like it to ensure that the specific concerns of migrant women are addressed by domestic worker unions across the region, navigating the gap between regional promise and a stubborn national reality. Two scales that, as Norman pointed out, sadly continue to be irrevocably at odds with each other in the Caribbean. To conclude. A close and critical mapping of the two examples, Shibad, you know. A close and critical mapping of the two examples I have sketched here promises to denaturalize or expose the territorializing and exclusionary practices of Westminster in the Caribbean, underlining in the first case the restrictive supremacy of Parliament and in the second case the privileging of national over regional space. In raising the important questions with which I open this paper, Norman Gervin, in his challenge to us to rethink Westminster, urge the radical reconceptualization of sovereignty beyond a limited notion that, as he describes, conflates it, quote, with the possession of certain constitutional and juridical attributes by the nation state, end quote. If we are really to answer the question posed in a letter to the Guyanese newspapers by women, how will we organize to live? And if, as the late political scientist Richard Eiton notes, quote, Politics is, among other things, a contest about what matters and what ought to be subject to consideration and debate, end quote. I want to end by tentatively suggesting that the promise of a Caribbean feminist geopolitics is that it asks us to expand the terrain of what is possible,
by envisioning and constructing forms of political community that are not so deeply and jealously territorialized. It nudges us to rethink what sovereignty might mean in the Anglophone Caribbean, untethered from a state-centric and ultimately limited vision. The challenge, and ultimately the promise, is this, to imagine what insurgent knowledges might emerge when we attend closely to what Cecilia Green describes as, quote, the nooks and crannies and living networks of the popular and domestic economy and its creative potential, end quote, what Sinity, I think, was talking about. Those deeply gendered practices that make heartbreakingly visible the violence of capitalism and the violence of sovereignty in the region, all while still stubbornly, persistently reaching for other, more affirming models of humanity, humanness, and value. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies. I must say the discipline was most excellent. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> okay, the floor is open for some questions, and we have 20 minutes. Uh, Hamid Ghani, University of Western East St. Augustine. Um, I just wanted to ask Alyssa um, about the uh, Guyanese situation regarding uh, the absence of local government elections over 20 years and the role uh, or, or what role women have played uh, given the history outlined of, of, of protest and, and, uh, and activism in respect of a number of public policy areas. Uh, I know in Trinidad and Tobago it was a matter of considerable uh, controversy when um, the previous administration postponed local government elections on three successive occasions and uh, in the case of Guyana, uh, the 20 year absence of local government elections. If you have any thoughts on, on the responses of, of groups in the society to that and what kind of activism uh, has been or can be developed around that to have those local government elections held. Uh, seeing that many of the, the councils have now, in some cases, exhausted the, 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 the PR lists for replacements and there are no more replacements available because there are no more names left on the list in some instances to be able to populate uh, those, those councils. Um, it's a matter of some concern because I've had an interest in it, um, it more or less came forcibly to my attention a, a couple of years ago and I've been trying to follow it. I know that uh, the minister responsible for local government gave an undertaking to have it in 2013. Uh, we're in 2014 now and it still hasn't happened and I don't know if you have any insights into it or if you have any any thoughts about the consciousness and the protest uh, that can take place to, yeah, to, to bring about that? I, I, don't, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, I mean, what's happening in Guyana is really an egregious situation. I mean, we're in a situation right now where the joint opposition, it looks like they will be bringing in no confidence vote against the government and we might be heading into an election. So we're right into the middle of silly season huge polarization because this has been practiced in Guyana and, um, and, and no discussion about whether there will be local government elections. Um, just yesterday, I believe, the head of APNU, David Ranger, issued an ultimatum to the president, Donald Ramatar, that if local government elections weren't held within a specified time period, he would, well, I really know what he would do, but he's talking about <laughs> domestic and international mobilization in relation to that. Um, and there were some very unhelpful suggestions on the part of the government. At one point, with the local government, Minister Norman Whitaker said something like, guys, these people aren't really ready for local government elections. They're not educated enough to have it. And then there were discussions about the list. In the meantime, they, they have fostered um, or foisted these interim management committees, which are on elected on representative in, in, in several areas. Um, but you know, it is a bit it is a bit of a challenge and the, despite the fact that in the case of Bayani here I pointed to this example from Linden, which I thought was a really hopeful and interrupting sign, that the truth of the matter is that, you know, um, Sinity, you talked about this subversive element across the Caribbean. Well, you know, in Guyana the, the level of demobilization has been um, just extremely dread, and the, 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 the you know the tribalism uh, and the way in which that relates to the form of political process, I think, has crept into the way in which local government elections are sort of perceived, and it's tragic because at the same time, it is only with meaningful reinvigoration of democracy at these local levels, the the reinvigoration of local 
um, government. Um, going back to many of our historic traditions, like the fact that we had the largest um, village movement in the Caribbean in the post-emancipation period, and the systems of local democracy that were devised by people that have really been gutted, um, not just as a result of this 20-year absence, but were also gutted under the, um, the PNC administration during the 24 years of dictatorship. So this is really, um, a question to which I, I'm not sure what the answer is. I, I can certainly say that most of the mobilization has been at the level of the formal political opposition, but outside of that, uh, people have not really been mobilizing in a sustained way to call for that. Good afternoon, Leith Dunn Institute for Gender and Development Studies. I want to address the issue of the collective defense of rights of domestic workers and household workers. Um, thanks very much for putting this on the agenda because a lot of work has in fact been happening in terms of research and training, but also establishing standards for the um, NBQs and CBQs. Um, for example, the Jamaica Household Workers Union, which is a member of the Caribbean Domestic Workers Network, um, has in fact been doing work on the Convention 189, Decent Work for Domestic Workers, which gives them agency power and so on. Um, working too with the Caribbean Domestic Workers Network to have this rolled out across the region. Um, what it means is that the rights of household workers um, will be enhanced and also to note that they've been doing training on how they can access the CSME. So to me, um, it, the future looks brighter in terms of household workers, domestic workers, being able to participate um, and, and advance their rights. So thanks for putting that on the agenda. technical and vocational qualifications and training institutions that the, the ground is not level across the region. Um, Jamaica has had, um, for a long time, they have had technical training. Um, expanding training to domestic workers is just, you're expanding the structures that already exist. Whereas for most of the Eastern Caribbean countries, we don't have those kinds of um, training institutions. And um, I think that just to say that what is happening in Jamaica is not replicate, replicated in the same way across the Caribbean. So there are still, a lot of us are still way behind in terms of being able to access um, those freedom of movement provisions, limited as they are. Yeah, um, Professor is right, um, but I remain hopeful because the issues on the agenda and also the, um, the Jamaican standards have in fact been shared with a number of Caribbean countries. What is interesting is that they have reduced the elements of this um, NBQ, thinking that domestic workers should not in fact have certain standards. They have reduced the content of it. Um, I remain hopeful though because there is a very strong movement um, growing among the different domestic workers associations. We have only two in the Caribbean, but other trade unions have in fact put this issue on their agenda. So the idea is that the trade union movement in countries that don't actually have an organized domestic workers network can in fact support this and have it more um, centralized. Yeah. Well, in Trinidad we have a unique problem. We have very organized, organized um, domestic workers but the, the problem is that they, they lobby to be defined as workers and therefore get protection under the Industrial Relations Act has not been um, supported so far. That's a big lobby. And therefore, as domestic, employ as domestic workers, not employees, um, they, have, they lack a lot of protections. Yeah. Um, the defining domestic work is a major challenge, for example, across the region. And in fact, um, the recommendation from a recent study we did for UN Women was that the labor statistics 
need to now include domestic workers as a category. That means that you can identify as well as register because unless you have a more organized domestic workers labor force across the region, the defense of rights and access to democracy is going to be limited. Um, while I'm on the floor, I just want to acknowledge the role that the Bureau of Gender Affairs, Women's Affairs in Jamaica has in fact um, supported the rights of domestic workers over since the 1990s, and there have been a number of conferences of Caribbean domestic workers. Thanks for coming. What a nice Friday afternoon crowd.